Uh, hi, my name's John. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Uh, so this is me. This is my email. Uh, in case you haven't already read it, this is me on Twitter. Uh, I'm a principal developer advocate for uh, Telerik. This is our company. This is our website here. If you go to Telerik.com, you'll see a site that looks like this. Anyone here a Telerik customer? Really? Wow, at the end you will be. Uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, inspire you to adopt our tools. So uh, Telerik's been in the .NET space for a long, long time. We've, uh, we're a company that's uh, over a decade old. We have uh, offices uh, across many countries, including one here in, the, in, uh, in Australia. And uh, we uh, have traditionally specialized in the .NET space, providing UI controls and tools. So if you're doing anything with Windows Form, uh, Windows 8, uh, .NET, WPF, Silverlight, etc. We have a number of controls that you can target. I'm not here to talk to you about that today. I'm going to talk about Visual Studio and uh, building uh, hybrid mobile apps. Um, but just wanted to get that out there just so you guys are aware. Uh, so that's at telework.com. You can check us out. So I'm going to jump over here through the magic of software over to Windows. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is a update that shipped uh, back on May 12th which is Visual Studio Update 2. Uh, Adam asked if you guys had installed this yet. Uh, this has been available uh, for a little while in previews, but now is available as an RTM. And this offers some really, really nice facilities for uh, building out mobile apps, particularly for Windows Phone. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about uh, some of the, the new capabilities there. And then I'll kind of weave in the story of uh, how Telerik gets involved from that aspect. So to install uh, Update 2, you simply go to wherever the link is to download it. It's, it's, it's off visualstudio.com or MSDN. Uh, you'll get that nice big install download window that they have, and uh, it will go ahead and update it. When you, up, when you go ahead and install it, um, nothing terribly looks different. So if we go into our file dialog, um, you, know, you still have your project template types. Uh, but there is this new uh, section here called Universal Apps. So Universal Apps are apps that, um, it, it is really an, uh, a bit of an homage, if you will, to Apple. Uh, Apple had the same sort of scenario it faced where uh, developers wanted to develop for iOS and for macOS at the same time. And so they introduced this concept of a uni universal binary. The, the name is literally the same. It's called the universal binary. And the idea there is that you can build a executable that will run on both iOS and uh, Mac OS. Um, the same uh, concept here applies. These are universal single binaries that will be, uh, they're very portable in that sense. They can run both on Windows and on Windows Phone. And the, the ramifications of that are, uh, are subtle, but uh, basically gives you a way of, of building these out very, uh, very um, quickly and uh, gives, you, gives you a means of, of building those out. Um, We've, we've been building towards this for a while. So, you know, for a while we've had this notion of what are called portable class libraries, where uh, basically you write your libraries in such a way that you don't take critical dependencies on the underlying platform uh, if you're writing out DLLs. And so um, portable class libraries have been around for a bit, uh, but now this idea of having it at the, the executable level uh, really kind of uh, speaks home. Uh, inside of Update 2, there's also uh, some new project template types. In particular, this is WebView app, which uh, is really, really nice. So is, if anyone's familiar with the WebView, it's a control available in XAML that uh, t prior to Update 2 was actually a bit of a black box. It gave you this Chromeless browser that you could dump content into. So a lot of the times people would use like iframes and things of that nature. The problem with the WebView in the back, uh, back in the day was that it wasn't part of the display tree of XAML. It didn't have any capabilities that allowed you to hook into the event process. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff that was obfuscated. So the, you as a developer couldn't target it. Now the WebView has been vastly improved. There's a very rich event model behind it. And it, it has all kinds of really rich capabilities associated with it. So it integrates with touch. So you can do, you can do z zooming, uh, which is something you couldn't do with iframe. Uh, in a Windows 8 application. Um, you, there also has integration points with the debugger as well, which I'll show you. Uh, so really, really nice stuff there. Um, this is where I'm going to spend most of my time uh, tonight, talking a little bit about this, because I, I think it's actually um, a really great innovation that we've added here. And incidentally, if you take a look at this, uh, the, the template type itself, uh, you actually start to understand how PhoneGap works. So just to give you guys some context, PhoneGap is a uh, 
an environment where you can build what are called hybrid mobile apps. So just to lay the, to give you the lay of the land, there, there are native technologies which run on Windows Phone, for example, and those utilize uh, .NET and they utilize Silverlight, for example, and they will run native on the device. There's also web apps which we can target for the browser, so IE, uh, mobile IE, etc. And then there's this kind of in-between state. Now, the reality is with hybrid, it's actually not a choice of one versus the other. It can actually be a spectrum. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of times where you can actually mix and match native and hybrid together. PhoneGap does that. So PhoneGap provides two key things. One, it provides an app container. So it provides a container for your applications. And then two, it actually provides uh, the richness of the, the, the device that it runs on in web technologies. Because the problem domain that we exist in is when we're running, when we're running our apps and writing them in, in HTML5 and, and CSS and JavaScript, we're running inside of a browser which is sandboxed. So oftentimes in a, in a browser, if you're writing JavaScript code, you can't do things like the calendar or integrate with contacts or the, the compass, for example. These are specific native APIs that are uh, sandboxed away from you. And that's intentional, right? You want to run safely and sanely when you run on the web. Uh, so if you hit an address, foo.com, you, you, can, you can rely upon the fact that the sandbox will keep you safe. With PhoneGap, they annotate the, the global scope if, uh, of JavaScript to give you hooks into those APIs. And it does so across over eight platforms. So really, the, the motivation for PhoneGap, it's, its name is intentional. It's to bridge the gap that exists between native and web today so that uh, you can build these, these rich, immersive, native-like experiences with technologies that you know and love, specifically web. So that's the intent. Now, with this web view, this is the same idea. We have this web view control, which is a XAML, native XAML control, running inside of this, this application container. But the uh, artifacts for the application itself are HTML, CSS, and script. So just to share with you an example, we're going to go ahead and create a new project type, and we'll see what's generated. Oh, nice. Hopefully, I don't have to renew. <laughs> I, haven't, that, I swear to God, this was working yesterday. Now I have to renew. There you go. So when we go ahead and create this project template type, you'll see a structure that looks like this. So we have our Windows Phone uh, 8.1 um, deployment type. Oh, uh, by the way, I should, I should uh, also say this is Windows Phone 8.1. Um, we have a, uh, a collection of assets, which are our markup, our CSS, our script. And then we have these two XAML files. So we have app.xaml, which is our, basically our, 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 our bootstrapper, if you will. And then we have our main page.xaml, which is our host for the web view. So if we bring up main page.xaml, uh, what we should see in here is just a very simple description, which is uh, our, um, oops, excuse me, our web view. So inside here, we have our page. And then inside here, we have our web view. So our web view here is simply a container for our assets. Now, what's different with web view in 8.1 is that it exposes all of these events uh, that you can now hook into. So if I were to, for example, um, uh, started looking at the event model for this, um, there's a, a wide variety of events that are now exposed. And for some reason, Is it because of that dialogue? I would imagine it would be. So let me do one thing here. Uh, this, is, this is something that's the, the designer itself is not kicking in. So I'm going to go ahead and do this on the fly here. So we're going to fire up Visual Studio 2013 again, actually in a separate window. And uh, I may have to renew my license here for some reason. I don't know why. And so there you go. Um, this is always a nice thing about developing for Visual Studio is that things are very easy to dismiss, but when you do, things go wrong. So be mindful of that. To unlock the Windows Phone device. OK, I have a Windows Phone device here. So we'll just make sure I appease the gods. So this is a Nokia 920, uh, for those of you who are keeping score. And I'll show you why that's relevant in a second. And let's go ahead and create that new file type again. And hopefully, we'll get that same dialog and uh, we can resolve this issue. You can always tell when you're actually uh, iterating quickly on this is, and you're trying out new features when you see all of these. Let's go ahead and agree this time. Uh, you see all app, app 1, app 2, app 3, app 4, app 5, etc. I don't know why I have to renew this, but there you go. 
Apparently it's uh, it's it's expired. So this will this will be stuff that you'll have to do as well. You'll have to sign in. I don't know why I'm doing this, but there you go. I'll do whatever Microsoft says. All right, good. Oh, apparently it's 30 days. There you go. So, all right. So we're going to go create this project, and we'll jump back into the XAML for mainpage.xaml. And uh, this is just the, the part I wanted to show you here, which is uh, the web view itself, which is that host container uh, for your application. So the host container, which is your web view, will actually point to this page, which is index.html. So this is nothing more, nothing less than a very simple description of, uh, an, a, 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 of your structure. So you have a div tag here. You have a page title. But if we go ahead and run this inside of the emulator now for Windows Phone 8.1, which I have installed, uh, what we will see here is a very simple description, but gives us the structure for targeting uh, this environment. And the reason why we're doing this is because we're leveraging existing skills. So I can target WPF if I want to, but the reality is that you have a lot more developers at your disposal if you're a company that's hiring or you're a developer who's learning for the first time. Uh, the web tends to be more approachable for a lot of folks. So that, that's the intent, is to try and leverage our existing skills. So we have the emulator here. It's going to go ahead and deploy it, which you can see underneath the covers there. And once it's deployed, we're actually running this in, uh, in a debug mode. So what's interesting about this, there's our application. So we have my application, page title, et cetera. Um, we can actually start debugging this. So this is actually a, a new innovation that we have inside of uh, the Update 2 release as well. So one of the things you'll notice in here, we have this section here called Other Debug Targets. So I can now, if I so choose, debug uh, inter the, the Internet Explorer version running on Windows Phone if I wanted to. Uh, and I have other debug targets as well. The other thing that I can do is I also have uh, available to me my uh, other windows for debugging. So this is, again, running on the phone device itself. And I have my DOM Explorer here uh, if I wanted to. Now, the way I'll go ahead and debug this is I'll just go ahead and close this down for a second. There is one change you have to make if you're going to actually go ahead and do this. What this is doing is giving you the ability to do mixed mode debugging, if you will. It's allowing you to deb debug a uh, script running inside of an app container um, inside of a XAML app container, if you will. So uh, you can see we're, we're targeting Windows Phone 8.1. If we go to our debug section here, you'll see that we can uh, set our debug type here. So we're setting by default to managed only. We can now change this to script. So this is new in update two. And if we go ahead and fire up the emulator now, uh, we're going to see that DOM Explorer window up here that allow me to traverse the DOM tree on, uh, on, on Windows Phone. The reason why this is all relevant is because this is something we've never had before. Uh, this is something that's extremely important for us as developers building out these hybrid mobile experiences when targeting uh, Windows Phone in particular. Uh, this is an environment. So to understand why this is important is because um, Microsoft also, in addition to Update 2, released recently a uh, a release called multi, it's a very, in Microsoft's traditional fashion, they have this really long name called, uh, where is it? Visual Studio Multi-Device, where is it here? They've got tooling for Apache Cordova, which is the, um, the Apache um, uh, endorsed, if you will, uh, uh, code base for PhoneGap. They have this preview for what's called multi-device hybrid apps. Now, if you go ahead and install and run this for Visual Studio, um, they use a, a variety of, of tools that actually don't provide a really nice debug experience. They use a tool called Ripple, and they use um, integration points with uh, Android and, and so forth. In fact, funnily enough, it installs, when you install this, there's a bunch of dependencies installed, including iTunes. It installs Google Chrome, uh, and this is from Microsoft, so go figure. Um, but the reason why uh, this is actually a better story with Update 2 is the ability to debug uh, directly within uh, Visual Studio. So you'll notice here, inside of Visual Studio, I'm running in my debug session. I actually have the debugger connected to uh, my web page there. And if I went into, for example, my assets here, so uh, I have my, my page file here. If I had a script tag, let's go ahead and get out of debug mode. We can actually debug JavaScript now. Um, and JavaScript debugging is actually not, not anything new, but in the context of Windows Phone, this turns out to be immensely important because now we have the ability of doing this uh, inside of the debugger. So if I wanted to, I could just say var num 
equals zero. Uh, console dot log. Wow, that's slow. I'm not sure why. Foo. Uh, apparently, I'm still logged in as Adam. That might be the problem. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, and go ahead and set a breakpoint now uh, if I wanted to on say this this initialization. Thank you. And now, if I run the emulator, we should break on that. So again, this is for update two. Uh, this is a, a big time improvement over what we've had in the past. So there we go. And uh, yeah, definitely worth checking out. Now, the reason why I mentioned the, uh, the, the other release here, this multi-device hybrid apps uh, release, is we have project template types inside of Visual Studio now for this release that you can use as well. But the debug experience is non-optimal. Um, so if you go and create a new file type here, for example, Come on, Visual Studio. So I'll say file new project. Down here, you'll see we have um, this new project template type here under JavaScript, multi-device hybrid apps. Um, they does support JavaScript, but more interestingly, they also support TypeScript. So when you install this, you can actually write these applications also using TypeScript. So that, that turns out to be really, really nice. But the, the unfortunate part of this story is that they haven't actually integrated with the remote debugging story. Uh, that's integrated with Windows Phone 8.1. And the reasons for this is nuanced, which I'll get into in a second. But just to show you what this actually generates when you create a new project, project type using these bits. Um, this is brand new, by the way. This came out like last week. And uh, I just wanted to show you guys this because I think it's important. But when you go ahead and build this out, they actually, um, they actually use Cordova heavily. So you're not going to see in the same structure here uh, that you saw before. Here you're seeing actually Cordova in its purest form. So Cordova is, um, and PhoneGap run via command line tools, which I can show you. So these command line tools, just a CLI, so you can, cr you can generate these projects very simply. So I'm here in my dev folder. If I want to create a new project, and let's call it Sydney, um, I'll say PhoneGap create Sydney. And then if I navigate to Sydney, it creates this directory structure that contains these well-known locations. Your project lives in a directory called www. So inside of www, it has all these files that are relevant, obviously, to the application. It has a config file, which is relevant to PhoneGap, uh, and a variety of other things. Those things map uh, to what you see in Visual Studio. So inside of Visual Studio here, for this project type, you'll see that they map. So those were generated by Cordova through this tool, but it is different than what you saw earlier with the ability to create a web view driven app. So they are different. Now, the reasons why they don't support remote debugging is, uh, is nuanced. And I took notes on this. So this is the gist that I published up on GitHub. I went through this, and it took me a, a weekend to figure out why this wasn't working. When you convert an application using Cordova or PhoneGap uh, to a Windows Phone 8.1 application, uh, it actually converts it into a Silverlight-driven app. So you have to remember that you're, a lot of developers are coming to this platform, Windows 8.1, using a brownfield situation. They have apps that they've built using Silverlight, which is a runtime environment for Windows Phone. And in fact, let me show you what that looks like. So if you're going to upgrade to Windows Phone 8.1, here's what it looks like. So we'll create a new project type. And um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, you can see here, uh, oh, not you. So l let's go through this process of actually um, generating this. So I'm going to go ahead and back into PhoneGap. I'll say PhoneGap build. And then I'm going to target Windows Phone 8. So what this does is it actually spits out a solution for you. If you haven't seen PhoneGap before, this is how you do PhoneGap development. Um, and then from here, what I can do is jump into that location. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Explorer. There we go. Come on, Windows. And then uh, inside of my dev uh, folder, we'll have that new folder called Sydney. And then down in the www structure, we should actually in the, um, in the uh, platforms folder, we'll now have this new folder called WP8, which is there. And then inside there, it generates for you this, this uh, project file. So there's my project file. Let's go ahead and open this up. And it's going to open up in Visual Studio. And the reason why this re is relevant is because it's actually going to, it's going to, it's going to open it up as a Windows Phone 8 project. So if you're targeting Windows Phone 8 and you're wanting to go to Windows Phone 8.1, this is what's going to happen. I'll show you what's going to happen in this instance. So this is also relevant if you're doing PhoneGap development. So just be mindful of that. 
So we're going to fire this up, and in a second, you'll notice that it actually is a Windows Phone 8 Silverlight app. All right, so here's my solution. It's a Windows Phone 8 solution. Now, when you're converting to 8.1, sorry, uh, the way that you'll do this is you'll right-click on your solution file, or your project file, and you'll retarget for Windows Phone 8.1. Now, the problem with this is when you do this, you, you still can't debug using that script debugger that I showed you earlier, because it converts it as a Silverlight application. So Silverlight still lives in Windows Phone 8.1, whether you know it or not. It's, it's there for supporting uh, backwards compatibility. The reality is, though, that it still will run, um, but it just won't run well at runtime. So I'll show you what this means. So we've taken this Silverlight, this PhoneGap application, we've converted it to Windows Phone 8.1, and in a second, what you'll see here is we're going to get an exception thrown. And the reason for this is because um, Currently, when, when PhoneGap generates that code through that command line tool I showed you earlier, it actually does so using an old control. So the host container for PhoneGap apps is this control called Microsoft.phone.webbrowser. And the problem with the web, well, there's no problem with the web browser, but it's a Silverlight targeted web browser. It's a Silverlight, it's a Silverlight control, basically. And you get, these, you get these compile time problems because with the web view today, with this new control we have in Windows Phone 8, it does a lot of its stuff via async. And we're using the non-async controls here, uh, so the non-async APIs for this uh, previous uh, version of the web browser. Basically, there, there, there needs to be some work done by the Cordova team to get this upgraded. So the reality is, if you're doing PhoneGap work today, and you're using the CLI, or you're using the multi-platform uh, multi apps plugin for Visual Studio, you're going to face some problems going forward with, with Windows Phone 8.1. Uh, these are going to be resolved, obviously, at some point. And uh, I've also forwarded these notes to the, the folks who run, uh, who actually own Cordova for W uh, Windows Phone. Uh, so they're, they're aware of that. Um, a lot of this stuff will actually go away. A lot of stuff that the, the, the browser control is doing here for uh, PhoneGap is actually doing stuff that is now exposed for, uh, for, for uh, hybrid apps. So there's these things like invoke script, which is you're basically telling the browser, go run this JavaScript in, in your instance. Um, and there's, there's ways in which, and there's reasons why Cordova does this. Um, but this is now exposed through this rich API model that we have available in WebView, which is really, really nice. So there we go. Now, so this is a problem. The, so the other problem that we have with, um, with these, uh, these hybrid app uh, uh, experiences. So if we're targeting, um, say, for example, this new project template type that we have. So this is this new project template type that Microsoft's come out with, this multi-device hybrid apps. If you go ahead and take a look at the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the build uh, deployment models, rather. So we can target Ripple. We can target, um, we can we can target emulators that are running on our, our platform here. Um, but we don't have the ability of doing builds for, say, iOS or for other platforms as well. I'm just going to go ahead and shut that down because I don't want that. Um, the reason for that is because we don't have, there's no tooling for building iOS apps uh, in, inside of this, this environment. So we have this, we have this situation, we have a non-starter situation where we're building hybrid apps, but we have no means of building them. Now, there are services out there that you can use. One example is uh, a service from PhoneGap itself which is at build.phonegap.com. And this is their remote build tool. Um, but the problem with this is you have to upload assets. You have to get notified that it's gone ahead and built them. Uh, it, it, it's not as seamless as you might like for Visual Studio. And all this is a segue to uh, the tools that we have, which is called App Builder. So uh, I'm now going to segue into the, the, the part of the, the talk that I really wanted to get to. So we have this new, uh, this new integration point from Telerik called App Builder. And uh, I'll show you what this looks like. In order to, uh, to see this, I'll go ahead and just uh, bring up our homepage here. So if you go to Telerik.com, we have a integration story with Visual Studio to allow you to build these rich experiences with a tool called App Builder. This is uh, free to download. Um, the services themselves, though, you will pay for for remote builds and such. But we have IDE integration with a number of different clients, including Visual Studio, which is our extension here. But if you're using text editors like Sublime Text or a Windows client that we have, uh, we also have a browser client, which you can see as well. Uh, you have those at your disposal if you so wish. So let's see how this actually all hangs together. And in order to save myself here, I'm just going to go ahead and 
close all of these instances here because I think this is part of the problem that I'm facing. I have too many debug sessions going on. Yes, I know you're not responding. It's okay. I'll go ahead and just uh, deal with it. Anyone here tried out the multi-device platform stuff yet? You guys heard about it at all? Anyone, you got, none of you have ins installed update two. I know that. So, all right. So that's going to be your first task is to go and update uh, Visual Studio. So let's go ahead and run Visual Studio 2013, and we'll go ahead and create a project using App Builder. So I've kind of given you a situation of a lot of badness. Now I want to show you how you can get around this. So with App Builder, um, we have this facility that allows you to create these project template types that allow you to also build not only for Windows Phone, but also for Android and for also iOS. So let's see how this happens. So I've gone ahead and installed this already, but I'll show you where you go ahead and, and grab these bits. So you're going to go into your Extensions and Updates menu. You're going to go click on Online. You're going to do a search for Telerik. Now we have a number of control sets in there uh, for UI controls and so forth. The one that you're going to want to grab is the one for App Builder, which is there. So if you want to see the more information page, this is available up on the Visual Studio Gallery. This integrates heavily with, app, uh, sorry, with Visual Studio in a number of different ways, but the intention is very clear. You can build these rich experiences using Visual Studio, and you can generate binaries using this. This is different than any of our solutions you've seen today. So we'll jump back into Visual Studio, and we're going to go ahead and create a new project. So once it's installed, we'll go ahead and say File, New Project. And inside there, we have a category, which is Telerik. Um, if you install other tools, you're going to see other categories as well. So the first thing you're going to notice is we have these project template types. So we have a blank project that's based off of PhoneGap. We have one that's based off of jQuery Mobile. And then we have two that are based off of Kenda UI. So Kenda UI comes in three flavors, DataViz, Web, and Mobile. The one that I'm going to build here is mobile. And let's go ahead and click OK. So when we create this project type, we create a structure inside of your Solution Explorer. Um, and it doesn't look terribly dissimilar from the same experience you saw previously with PhoneGap and with the multi-device platform release from Microsoft. The difference here, though, is that we can actually generate builds for other platforms beyond uh, what you've already seen. So what we have here is a structure that gives me an application. If I wanted to, I could run this inside of a simulator. So we have a number of simulators built into this, uh, this, this, uh, this extension. And these simulators allow me to simulate iOS, Android, Windows Phone using this structure. So the structure that I had before, which I'll just show you here, is just markup. So they're div tags, LIs, HTML5, and JavaScript but I'm able to create these rich experiences that run inside of platforms like iOS, like Android, and like Windows Phone. And in fact, you can swap out the version number quite easily just by, or sorry, the deployment by simply changing this within the device simulator. So if I want to see Android, we see Android. If I want to see Windows Phone, we see Windows Phone. There's no changes to your code there. That's all structurally the same markup and, and JavaScript. So in effect, it's kind of like the run one, uh, write once, run everywhere. Uh, sort of uh, promise of Java. However, in this instance, because we're utilizing web, which already has that implicitly built, that notion of write once, run everywhere, uh, in some respects, uh, already built in, except for edge cases, of course, um, we get a lot of richness, richness in terms of building out these experiences. Now, the thing about Kenda UI Mobile is that it's trying to preserve the fidelity of a native experience. So you'll notice this looks like Metro. You'll notice also when we swap out versions for iPhone, for example, so here's version 7, I can go to version 6. You notice we theme it accordingly. That's our intent with Kenda UI Mobile, and all this, by the way, is available, again, as open source. You can go ahead and download this and use this today. We have some capabilities built into the simulator as well, which allow you to interact with the local storage uh, and contacts of the device. So you can simulate things like uh, temporary contacts. This is sort of like uh, lorem ipsum of contacts. Uh, you can uh, go ahead and interact with local storage as well if you want to go ahead and simulate like photos and other things that are stored in temporary locations on the device that you can then integrate with in JavaScript. We can simulate the, ge the, the aspects of geolocation, so we can give ourselves new lat long values and simulate that. And we can also simulate various states of the radio, so we can simulate whether or not you have a connection, whether or not you have Wi-Fi, etc. Those are all built into a simulator experience that preserves that fidelity of the device that it's running on. And so you can now start targeting this within Visual Studio. So that's one aspect of this. The other aspect of this is because we're running Cordova, we have the ability of surfacing out what are called plugins. 
So the way that you'll traditionally do this in other experiences or in other environments is you'll have to do this against XML. So the reality is, is that this is exposed through Cordova as XML, but here we actually surface this out through a rich interface. So everything that you're targeting here is exposing out the capabilities of each device. So as you publish these applications, these devices need to know aspects of like, what does the icon look like? What are the capabilities I have in the background? Because certain apps run differently in different modes. Uh, here are the icons for iPhone, iPad, etc. I can change these if I so choose. And we generate all those for you accordingly. So we have splash screens as well. Here's Android. Android does its permissions a little bit differently, so we can either enable or disable hardware acceleration. Here are the permissions that I wish to opt in, for example, for accessing the internet or accessing the camera. Again, this is all exposed very, very clearly through this interface. Here's Windows Phone. So Windows Phone does some things a little bit interesting. Uh, in Windows Phone 8, we had an, a WM uh, app manifest.xml file. Uh, that is now a, um, a AppX manifest file. Uh, so that's been changed as well. That's a new change as well for Windows Phone 8.1. But you can see the same sort of capabilities are here are exposed as well. And if I wanted to, I could also go ahead and add capabilities for accessing things like you know contacts and, and so forth. So all of this is, is really nice. The, the big win for me, though, and because I've been doing PhoneGap for a while, is this. The ability to turn on and off plugins, including ones that are custom. So PhoneGap works with integration for back-end services like the console, uh, like the camera, through a set of native plugins. These are native pieces of, of code that interface via JavaScript to the app container. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because it's actually quite relevant when you start looking at actually to generate builds. So an app builder, we can run inside of what's, what's called the simulator, but we can also generate builds using our cloud infrastructure. So let's see how that works. So if I want to, I can actually generate binaries for Android, iOS, and Windows Phone, and I don't even need any of that infrastructure. I don't need Xcode. I don't need a Mac, even though I'm running a Mac. I don't need a Mac if I want to. I'm running on Windows here. I can generate these binaries. Now, when I generate these binaries, sorry, let's just keep popping up. Um, I can generate the app package, which is that um, a, that uh, APA, uh, sorry, IPA file. It's like a it's like a AppX file. It's just an app container for your for your code. Um, I can generate that app package. It's going to go ahead and utilize the provisioning profile I've set up with developer.apple.com. It's going to allow me to go ahead and generate these builds. But the other thing that I can do is I can I can use this what's called an app builder companion app. So this is an app that we have available up on the App Store. And what it allows you to do is interface with uh, a, a, an application that we have here to, to pull down these apps very quickly and easily for uh, running on the device. So let's see how that works. So I'm going to go ahead and, and generate a build. And it's going to generate for me a QR code here. And the reason why it's doing this is because um, it's really, it's really kind of quickening up the, the iteration cycle, uh, if you will, for generating these builds. So I have a QR code here. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and share out, uh, don't worry, AV guy, you won't have to do a thing. I'm going to go ahead and share out or mirror my iPhone. So this is my iPhone here. So you can see this is actually live here. So I'm showing this on the webcam. So what I can do is I'm going to run this. This, this is uh, an app I've already built. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and scan this QR code here. And I'm going to go ahead and deploy this app to my iPhone. So you can see it's live. There's everyone. Hi. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and now scan this code. And it's going to pull down that app package and allow me to run this app on the device itself. Oh, sorry, I've got to show you my reflector. There we go. <laughs> so it's gone ahead and swapped that out. There's my app. I can go ahead and interact with this. There's location. So there we are. Right? Oops. There's the weather, etc. Now, I have this on my, my phone. This is an app that I've built using Kenda UI Mobile on my phone. Let's go ahead and now make some changes. So I'm going to go ahead and in here. Um, you'll notice here inside we have, intera we have interaction uh, with our devices if we want to go ahead and deploy there. We have project deployment as well, which I'll show you. But if I wanted to, I go ahead and update this. So on this, this phone, I have my, my, my top here is listed as welcome, Telework App Builder, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. I'm going to say, uh, yo, Sydney. And then... Just go ahead and nuke this and say sub. So we'll go ahead and save that. And if we jump back to our phone, I'm going to go ahead and do a, what's called a three finger salute. I'm going to show this on the webcam here. I'm going to go ahead and tap with three fingers. It's going to go ahead and download this package. 
And what, this is a facility we have built into uh, App Builder, which is called LiveSync. And what this allows me to do, oops, not you, I've got to save this. I have to do this with the project type. Go ahead and build. And uh, what this allows me to do is now build this uh, for the iOS uh, App Builder companion app if I wanted to. So with this now deployed, I can actually just generate this QR code and then just go ahead and update it accordingly for the app itself. So I'll just go ahead and let this change here. So there's, there's the change that I've made. So very easy to deploy these changes. This is running inside of an app container. Uh, and this is all targeting, obviously, uh, angle brackets and script, which turns out to be really nice. Now, as I said before, I can also generate builds. So let me go ahead and just do that. And before I do that, I just need to go into my project properties here because I have certain uh, facilities set up uh, and in certain ways. I've got to change my app identifier here. I have an app provision that only uses my, uh, my reverse uh, URN uh, signature for this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate an uh, actual build here. So not in the simulator, excuse me. I'm going to generate a build that will actually run on the native device. So I'm going to go ahead and say build in cloud, and I'm going to generate a binary app package here. So it's going to go ahead and take my provisioning profile. It's going to go ahead and generate my IPA. Now this takes a little bit of time. What's happening here is the assets are going up to the cloud. Depending upon your network connection, this will vary. But what's going to happen is you're going to get an IPA file. And that IPA file you can then, this is a native app container for iOS, that you can then push and deploy via iTunes. So iTunes is here, um, you know, not the best piece of software in the world, but there you go. Um, so that's iTunes, and then when you have that IPA, believe it or not, that is the app deployment story for uh, iOS. I know that it's much, much better on Windows Phone. You have the application deployment tool, uh, which is a hell of a lot better. Uh, you guys have seen this, right? This is way, way better than iTunes, but, you know, Apple gives us, we, we taketh what Apple giveth, so uh, there we go. So this is generating this in the cloud, seeing those assets, generating the IPA, and then once that's done, will allow us to deploy natively to the device. Um, everything I'm showing you here, by the way, by the way I can actually do with in, inside of a browser window as well. So if we go and fire up Chrome, for example, and I go to platform.telerik.com, let me go ahead and move this out of the way here. Everything I've shown you here can be done inside of a, a browser window. I can, all do, I can also do this, if I so wish, inside of Sublime Text. Uh, I, can all the, I can also do this inside, if, if I so choose, inside of uh, uh, other tools as well, including our WPF client that we have. Sorry, just choose a different uh, login here. Uh, yes. So I'm going to go ahead and log in here. And you're going to see a, a different view of the world, but uh, fundamentally it's the same idea. So inside of this, we're seeing a different view of the world, but it is, it is basically the same concept. So when you start off, you're going to see a, uh, an experience that looks like this. this is, uh, these are called workspaces. They're kind of like solutions in VS. So solutions are collections of projects. Workspaces are collections of projects as well. We'll go ahead and create a new workspace here. We'll give this one a name called Sydney as well. We'll create this workspace. And when this workspace is created, we can create a number of different sub-projects. The one I just showed you was App Builder, but we have other ones as well. I'm not going to have time to show you all that. But I just want to show you here how this experience actually flows between different clients as you see fit. So I can choose that same project template type, or I can use a new one like DataViz, and I can give it a name. Data is cool. And create this project. And all the facilities I had before, like build, running inside of a simulator, being able to generate builds, et cetera, et cetera, I can actually do this within the browser as well. Um, we can also generate this via CLI. So we have a CLI that you can target as well. So I'll just briefly show you uh, that while it's running. So if I go here, um, I can go and say App Builder. And we have a, f we have a CLI that you can target to create builds. Um, so I can say App Builder, create, and then create builds. and um, and uh, start generating that code directly. So here we have a similar sort of environment. We have, uh, you know, our, our solution on the right. Uh, we have syntax highlighting. We have Emmet support. We have simulator support. Uh, we can generate we can generate these projects off of a Git repository if we want. So I can go in the iOS simulator here and simulate this. All these sort of facilities are similar uh, in terms of the integration story. So I just want to make that clear when you're doing this. Uh, it is something that you can actually uh, experience and check out. 
And I can also generate builds. So I'll just quickly show you how that's done. So I'll generate a build here. And again, I'll do it with iOS. And I'll do it with the companion app again. And we'll generate that QR code. I'm going to go ahead and fire up Reflector again. And then I'll go ahead and share my phone and show you how this actually just is easy to deploy. So there's my phone. I'm going to go into, I'll just do a two finger salute across. We have a built in QR scanner. I scan this code. It pulls down the app package. And then if I want, I can go ahead and uh, get, these, this is our data viz collection here for uh, interacting with uh, rich charts and graphs. So I, even I have fat fingers and it works well for me. So it's rich, rich support for touch. Um, this is all based on SVG. Uh, we also have support for Canvas as well, if you are so inclined. And if I wanted to, I could also make changes here as well. So you can see our title is called pie chart. I'll say, hello, Sydney. And I'll save that, and then I'll do a three finger on my device here. Ugh. Sorry, my, my fingers do not work well with the iPhone. I've got, uh, I've got very, I've got, I would have been a good member of the, uh, the hobbits on Lord of the Rings. I think I have that similar sort of genetic structure of big hands, you know, sort of thing. And there you can see, hello, Sydney. So uh, you can see how we can build these out very quickly, these experiences, uh, using our tool set for this. And again, this is very unique. I mean, like, you're not seeing too many other vendors who, actually, I think not many vendors at all that actually provide this sort of integration story. Uh, jumping back to Visual Studio, so we've gone ahead and we've issued this build. Now we can download the IPA. So there's my IPA, app.ipa. I can go ahead and double click this, and this will fire up uh, iTunes and give me an option of deploying this directly to my device. So we take a look at the apps. Again, this is all without Xcode. So there's my app that I built called Mobile Project One, and I can go ahead and install that onto my device if I so wish, sync, and then run. So that turns out to be really, really nice. I mean, as a, as a developer who's, you know, I'm, I'm more inclined to target web because that's my background and I like web. Um, being able to do this all within a rich environment like this gives me some really, really nice wins. We have some other abilities to do uh, things like deployment, and we can synchronize this with backend cloud services, et cetera. Um, lots of great facilities there. Um, but the idea is still the same. I can use web essentials with this, so I get the, the benefits of that. Um, I can do a whole heck of a lot of stuff with this. But um, yeah, I just wanted to spend some time just showing you this. I can keep talking, by the way, but it's 7.42, and uh, I want to ask if there are any questions. So I can show you some other stuff as well. So any questions on this so far from what I've shown? Um. Go ahead. Sorry, there's a mic, I'm sure. I'll repeat the question. It's okay. Yeah, so the question is, what's the overhead of the container that you're using to plug in the APIs? Uh, so th this really speaks to uh, PhoneGap itself. So PhoneGap is, again, that app container. There are other providers of other app containers as well. Um, but uh, PhoneGap itself actually, the, 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 this is actually speaks to, to a lot of concerns that people sometimes have. They're like, oh, it's, it's a shim. It's going to slow me down. The reality is the, the latency of the, the app container is so low that you can actually build really, really rich experiences using this. And incidentally, I'll mention, let me go ahead and bring this up. There are a number of apps that you used, you have used, that you don't even know are a hybrid. And I'll show you some of them. Let me show you some. And you won't even tell that they're, you can't even tell that they're hybrid. So anyone used, for example, where is it here? Uh, oh gosh, where is Hang on. Okay, this is where uh, this failed. Anyone used Uber? That's hybrid. Anyone played 2448 or 2048? That's that's PhoneGap. Um, yeah, this is this is a hybrid app. Uh, Gmail hybrid. Um, there's just tons of apps that that you know. It's like <laughs> there's all these apps out there that are hybrid that people just don't know about. Um, and if you wanted to see some examples, there's there's a number of featured apps. Um, this is a wonderful app called Untapped. Um, I'm, I'm getting away from your question. I'm just realizing that. But um, the reality is, is a, lot of, a lot of companies are, are taking dependencies on hybrid because it gives them quick iterations, iteration times. Now, in terms of performance, um, there's, you know, you're seeing really rich experiences in gaming that are built that are targeting hybrid. Um, and uh, they're targeting Canvas and SVG to do so. 
the fidelity of, of the connection between, um, I'll, show, I'll show you untapped just to show you what it, how, how performant it works or how well it works. So untapped is a uh, social drinking. Uh, I'll probably use it tonight. And this is how you can check into beers. So this is built using PhoneGap as the app container. So here's, uh, here's scrolling. Here's a scrolling container. We have, we have kinetic scrolling in Kenda UI mobile. This is not uh, uh, anything to uh, brag about because some other folks have it. But if I go ahead and say, for example, check into a beer. So I'll check into Fat Yak, just for example. I can add a photo. So I'll take it from the camera. This is a camera plug-in, right? Looks pretty fast to me. I mean, this is, this is using uh, the, the hybrid plugins for, for, uh, for Cordova um, slash PhoneGap if I wanted to. We can swap, you know, the, the scroll container here. It actually, it, it feels, like it, there's actually a little bit of latency right now, but it's buttery smooth on here, right? Like this is, this is a web view, really. And uh, yeah, it runs really, really fast. Um, there are some apps that have been built with Telerik Platform that I can show you. These are just some of them. This is one called Bagwan Marine, uh, from this one called Live, Live Fleet from Bagwan Marine. This is built using a combination of Telerik Platform and Sitefinity, which is our CMS. And the scroll container here is super, super smooth. And it doesn't look super smooth on the, on the, uh, the projection here. But the reason for that is um, there's just a latency between the phone and device. But you can check it on your own phone if you want. Um, integration with Google Maps, right? I mean, the, the, the latency is low enough. And they've done a lot of work in the app container, uh, in the PhoneGap app container, to get that latency down as, as, as low as possible. Um, so there are games that are being built uh, today. And in fact, there's been, there's been a number of blog posts that have been written. Um, the, re the most recent one was the, uh, the one about uh, 2048. So 2048 was built targeting PhoneGap. And uh, yeah, uh, this, was, this took off like crazy. And uh, the, there was a blog post written about you know, um, why Gabriel decided to target uh, PhoneGap. But basically, you know, He's, he's basically citing the same things that I cited, which is, you know, I don't have experience in Objective-C or Java, or, and I don't want to target individual platforms. I want to cross-cut. So that gives me that, that ability to do so. Um, but there's, uh, there's really big wins to achieve from this. You, you, can, you can build these apps very quickly, even more so with our tools. See how I did that? So there you go. So um, there, are, there are tests that have been written. Uh, the PhoneGap team is very transparent about those tests that have been written about the latency. But the, 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 the layer you go through is so small. Um, and the, the plugins themselves are native. So the plugins you work with are native to the device. So the camera, the contacts, the accelerometer, all that stuff's native. And uh, we also, in addition to providing those templates, provide uh, project template types for each of those PhoneGap uh, uh, APIs that are exposed. So if you go into our uh, sample projects here, we have this section here called Core APIs. And what these are are all of the PhoneGap APIs that uh, you may want to target. We provide out of the box. Uh, let me show you the accelerometer one. That one's pretty cool. We can build this really quick. So I'll say accelerometer. And uh, this is using the native accelerometer uh, uh, integration for PhoneGap. So I'll go ahead and build this project. And we'll go ahead and deploy it to App Builder. This is how easy it is. You know, you, you too can do this. You can be an iPhone developer, even with Visual Studio, if you wanted. So everything I'm doing here, I can do with Visual Studio as well. And it's, uh, it's the sort of Annie's Got a Gun sort of song, anything you can do, I can do better sort of scenario. Um, we can definitely do this. We can, we can do this with web if we wanted to, if we see, feel so compelled. I feel like Obama in, you know, yes, we can, you know, sort of thing. So I'll go ahead and just build this, and then uh, we'll see how this runs on the device. iOS, App Builder, next. Um, so we'll go ahead and generate this. We'll go ahead and scan. And I, I choose iOS just because it's easy for me, because I've got this set up. But I have my Windows phone here. I can show you as well. And we'll see how this runs. So here's the accelerometer, start. So the fidelity is, is not coming through because of the, the latency, but it's actually, it's actually ticking like crazy on my side here. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's not going to be fast enough here. Yeah. So there's my accelerometer. It's also running inside of App Builder itself, so it's actually not running truly native to the, uh, the device here. So, but that's, that's using the accelerometer here for, um, 
for the integration part. Cool. Is there another question? The criticism about container strategy w was that um, because it didn't use native uh, code for UI, there were always subtle differences when, with the final application that you picked it and it wasn't quite an iOS app or it wasn't quite there. It, it, has those limitations been sort of addressed or, or limited now or do you still from see a, From a UI perspective, there are different frameworks that approach that differently. So there's a framework like jQuery Mobile which has a, more of an opinion on, on the way the UI should look. So their UI constructs are not native looking. Whereas with Kendo UI Mobile, ours are. So we try to preserve the fidelity of the native experience on the UI side. So um, it's just a different sort of a, you know, uh, uh, approach, if you will. So um, you know, jQuery Mobile, Sencha, Kony, um, they all have different sort of approaches to that, that, uh, that model. We believe that the one that a lot of developers want is we want it to look and feel and smell native. So the way I've actually termed it is, from a UI perspective, we're like the PhoneGap of the UI, where PhoneGap provides this native interface to plugins um, for camera, accelerometer, et cetera. We provide a, a native interface for iOS, Android, Windows Phone, and believe it or not, Mego and Blackberry if you want, um, if you're running that. So, um, so we provide those native implementations. And you can change the look and feel of that. We have plenty of customers who have so we've had many, many customers who have actually changed the look and feel of, of, of applications. And we have, we have skins that will apply to that. So we have this one here called Cuteness. Um, just go ahead and resize this. Whoa, where'd you go? All right, apparently I lost it. There you go. I'll go ahead and turn off mirroring, turn it back on. There you go. So this is uh, Cuteness.io, and this is using what's called our flat skin. So our flat skin is kind of like a modern sort of flat look that's kind of prevalent on iOS and, and so forth. Um, but this is, uh, this is nothing more, nothing less than uh, one of the skins that we support in Kendo UI. So if we wanted to take a look at this, you can go and check it out on KendoUI.com. We have this demos page that you can check out. We have a, what's called a theme builder. And this actually speaks to actually getting the, the look and feel of the app right. Sorry, this is not resizing the way I want. Oh, that's because that's you're in the way. So you have the theme builder uh, control here. It runs as an applet, so you can actually bookmark it and so forth. But what you can do is you can change the look and feel of this. All these are CSS rules. So we natively skin uh, the, the look and feel if you want. Uh, but if I wanted to, I could actually say, you know, apply red to the background or to, yeah, to there. And it applies to all those. Um, apply yellow to... Uh, the text item, for example, oh, that looks awful. Um, and then I can export this, and you can see it's just mark, it's just uh, CSS. So it's just CSS targeting that look and feel, but it is looking and feeling native by default. That's the intent. Now, to your point about you know having it feel snappy and all that sort of stuff, uh, yeah, I mean you can make you can make a native app suck. I mean, one of the, you know the the thing that that gets me a lot is people look at Facebook and they're like, oh, Facebook converted from uh, a, a hybrid to a native app, they still use web views inside of the application. I mean, you know, um, they, they also wrote a really shitty app, you know, not, not to put it blunt, but they, they wrote a really bad app. Like, their, their hybrid app, every time you'd hit the like, they put script blocks in there. So when you were scrolling through, I don't know if you remember the old app, uh, Facebook app, but if you were scrolling through there, it would get, the, it would get janky. It would stop, it would pause, and then continue to scroll. And the reason for that was because it would enter the web view as a script block. And what happens when we hit a script block is we pause execution because we have to process that. So there would be these script blocks that it would encounter and be like, and then, and so people were like, oh, it's, it's HTML5, it's too slow, let's go native. And oh, it's so much smoother. I'm like, yeah, because you wrote a crappy app to begin with. And you, can do the, you can do the exact same on the native side. So you can write really crappy apps that are, that are really slow. So... Um, it's like anything, you know. It's just how much do you want to shoot off of your foot. So. Oh, just. Uh, there, there wasn't anything that was in the app itself that 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 told me it was it was uh, native or non. It's just uh, you, you know you you hear stories and you talk to developers and. Um, I've talked to a few guys, and they, they've told me, oh, you know, that, that app over there is actually 
hybrid. You know, it's not a big secret. What I what I would love is a service that would allow me to tell tell me like uh, the percentage of apps that are actually hybrid in the marketplace, for example. Like I would love to have. There's a service called Built With. I don't know if you guys have seen it. This is actually an Aussie success story. These guys are in Manly. So M Built With is an example of a really nice app. You can go to ssw.com.au and it will break down based on the website what that site was built with. So you guys are using IS, you guys are using Exchange Online, you guys are using Ajax, our teller controls, using doubleclick.net, Google Analytics, etc. It grocks all that information based on the markup. I would love a tool like this that would tell me the exact same thing for mobile apps. So I could actually, I could actually point this at an app and say, what was that built with? What was this built with? Um, so yeah, we don't have that, unfortunately. But There's questions online? Yeah, he's been waiting. All right, let's wait. Let's, let's answer that one. Um, so his question is, I'm a C-sharp developer, so why should I even choose Teller's phone gap implementation rather than Xamarin, where I can write once in C-sharp and reuse it on iOS, Android, Mac OS, Windows apps, and Windows phone? All right, so Xamarin, uh, for those who aren't aware, the question is relating to why would I use Xamarin over Teller, for example. Um, we don't see really Xamarin as a competitor. In fact, we actually see it as, uh, in, some ways, in some respects, people have asked us, like, why don't you guys bail controls for Xamarin, for example. Um, Xamarin's a really interesting story. The idea here is with Xamarin, um, this is from Miguel de Acaza, who, who built um, Mono, and, um, which is the, uh, the open source version of .NET before it went .NET. And uh, these are a set of tools that run both on iOS, or rather, on uh, macOS, as well as within uh, Visual Studio. Um, these guys have uh, basically, the, the approach they've taken is we can cross-compile into uh, native binaries for uh, Android, iOS, and, and Mac, obviously, using C Sharp as the base language. Um, so C Sharp is a wonderful language. I'm a huge fan of it and uh, has some great facilities. The thing about, about Xamarin, though, is there's, there's a lot of missing dependencies with this, this story. So the thing they don't tell you is that they don't have um, a, a build solution for uh, various platforms, for example, and their pricing itself is is uh, something to be um, taken into account as well. I'm not going to badmouth them, um, you know. I don't want to, but uh, the approach here with Xamarin is is somewhat similar. Um, but the thing is, you know, you have to target C Sharp, which is for for some web devs, they're like, I don't know anything about C Sharp, you know. I'm I don't know anything about writing an extension method, or I don't know anything about lambdas, or um, you know, I don't know anything about link, for example. And uh, um, also, there's there's some things that when you when you start off well, like it, it starts off well for Hello World, but the reality is is that um, there's there's a lot of edge cases that I've I've heard incidentally um, that that don't um, that actually don't uh, uh, result in a, a a seamless experience as as they like to purport, but. Um, I'm not going to try and um, compare the two too much because they do approach the problem differently. So they approach it from the perspective of cross compilation, whereas we actually don't do that. We we actually just the the what you see is what you get in the web view, and that allows you to debug within a browser, which is a an F5 experience. Like it's like very seamless. People know it and love it. It works well. Um, so they approach the problem in two different ways. Um, so. The answer to your question is why? Why would I w use Xamarin over Telerik? Well, you you have to do you have to do the math yourself, right? They ha they have different licensing models. Um, this is their plans that they have. Um, we integrate with Visual Studio just as well. I mean, you know, if you take a look at the pricing for Telerik platform, for example, uh, it's ours starts at thirty nine dollars a month, and uh, that gets you a whole host of services, including cross compilation for. Um, for uh, iOS, et cetera. So uh, these are all the plans we have for App Builder, which is just that one part. But the other thing worth noting about Telerik Platform, it's also a set of other services that Xamarin don't have, backend services, uh, the ability for doing analytics, uh, testing, et cetera. We have a lot of stuff that they don't have. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. Xamarin actually acquired an uh, analytics company recently. Um, so there is some, some similarities there. but. Uh, it's worth noting uh, that there are some differences as well. It's different approaches, uh, but we don't we don't necessarily see them as a competitor. So it's a good question. But um, I, my my challenge to the questioner is is try us out. Uh, you can create a free starter account today for 30 days. You get all the features and prototype something. See how fast it takes to get to where you're going, and compare and let us know. And 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 honestly, let us know about how your experience is 
uh, with Tower Platform versus Xamarin. Uh, we're, we're open for, for any feedback. Um, yeah, so that's definitely something worth, worth noting there. Um, anyone, anyone developing mobile apps right now? You are? And you are? I, I assume with your shirt you're targeting Xamarin. Okay. And how are you targeting? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, try us out. You know, it's like the it's like the Pepsi taste challenge. You know, <laughs> try out try out uh, Telerik controls. We did actually go with a HTML5 app originally. Okay. But um, we had a lot of problems with a lot of um, development work, but it seems like you've solved a lot of the problems that we had. Okay. So the so for those watching online or for uh, the recording. Uh, the gentleman was making the point that we started down the road of HTML5, uh, but we had some problems uh, along the development stream, our workflow, etc. And it looks like we've addressed some of those. Yeah, some okay. Of the UI and the performance issues. Some of the UI and performance issues. Okay, that's good to hear. Let us let us know, and and actually, the the more than let us know. Take 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 the challenge. Build a prototype. Let us know, and if it works or not. And I think you'd be pleasantly surprised. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of myths out there, and the biggest one is native versus hybrid. I think people, I've, I've heard that more, more times than, than not. Uh, people are like, oh, I hear it's slow. I'm like, where have you heard this? We're, we're like, this isn't slow. There are tons of apps that you use that you just don't know about that are hybrid, you know? So, question. Have you noticed a trend within the cross-platform space of people moving away from using platform-specific theming uh, both for design consistency across the board and also to get away with some of the performance issues with using the CSS to render that style. So are you saying people are getting away from the native look and feel? Yeah, so, so rather than having an Android feel or an, an right. iOS feel, they have a company feel, a company style imposed sure. across uh, platforms. Yeah. That's very analogous to that flat skin I showed you earlier, um, which is one of uh, many that you can, you can use uh, as part of Telerik, uh, sorry, Kenda UI. Sorry, I mean, could you have, um, have you noticed that, or have you had people complain about the performance suffering because of the rendering of those uh, platform-specific skins? Uh, no, not particularly. I mean, they're just they're just CSS at the end of the day, and they're just they're just colors and and ways in which you can render content. A lot of our customers actually utilize uh, who utilize Kenda UI mobile uh, will will theme them. Uh, very differently than what we expect. There are many apps out there that Live Fleet I showed you was themed differently. Um, they're very easy to theme, um, but there's no there's no performance degradation on that because you're just changing things like you know RGB values and um, uh, padding and and margins and things like that. So uh, it's like asking like you know is is the is uh, is this theme of this website slower than that theme of that website? It's it's like no, not really. Unless you're doing something like you're doing things like you know, 3D transforms, or you're doing things that are kind of a little bit more complex. But uh, yeah, it, you're, remember you're in a Chromeless web route, web view, so the same sort of default supply. Um, that being said, though, um, obviously on iOS you're not running in the na the Nitro engine, uh, which is the the JavaScript engine to mobile Safari. So it is a little bit slower than native mobile Safari, but it is pretty performant. Um, and uh, they're doing a lot of work there to make JavaScript faster and faster. I mean, recently, Chrome added some support just recently to, sorry, uh, WebKit just recently added some support to, uh, for an AST, and uh, I know that uh, Firefox has one, uh, and Blink's working on that as well, so Blink is the, the JavaScript, or rather the engine for Chrome now, so. Is there a question here? Yeah, thanks. Um, so you mentioned earlier how the Kendo UI core is now open source Apache 2. Is, is that stuff useful without your platform? Absolutely. Yeah. So can you just yeah, grab a everything, phone gap? Yeah, everything, you can go nuts in. with, with Kendo UI core outside of a hybrid mobile scenario. Uh, I only put it in that context because I was, I was, whether you knew it or not, I was actually weaving a story of there's this, there's that, there's this, there's this, and then we have that. And, um, but the, the UI widgets we have in Kendo UI core, you can certainly use in a web instance if you wanted to. So. so no, I meant specifically staying within the the hybrid app, mm -hmm. but you know, just grab PhoneGap. Yep. Yeah, totally. Use your controls. Yeah, customers are using, using yeah, don't use Telerik platform. Yeah, customers are doing that today. Okay. You know, you could totally do that if you want. It's it's a seamless experience with App Builder. That's the only push I would play there. Yes, and there's other is. there's other parts of Telerik platform that I haven't shown you that uh, bear mention. Uh, in that in that conversation, like we have other types of, of projects that will complement that, uh, so backend services, analytics, mobile testing, feedback, prototyping, etc. 
Uh, we're providing that sort of ecosystem around what's necessary for building mobile apps. But you can totally go nuts with Kendi UI Core and PhoneGap, and then that's it. So, yeah. And in fact, a lot of our customers are have. I mean, we, I put out a call up on Twitter uh, today. I'll show you. Uh, I just. I, What's that? It also uses the Kendo UI core open source stuff. Yeah. So I, I put out a call for got an app built with Kendo UI or Telerik, and I, I got a lot of responses back saying, yeah, we built, uh, there's a site that's using this. We, uh, there's an app that's built using just Kendo UI and, and uh, Cordova. This is a Indian in, in uh, sorry, a gentleman in India uh, who built this app for voting in India, I think. Uh, there, there are other apps that were ref referenced here. ResGrid.com, client apps. These are all built with Kendo UI. So uh, you can see they look and feel different, but they are native. So Apple, Android, Windows Phone, that's the intent. You know, we provide this cross-cutting technology for that. So these are just, these are just, this is just today. These are some of the responses I just got today in the last few hours. But we've had, we, Kendo UI has been out for more than two and a half years and it's being very successfully adopted. We have a number of case studies available on our website. Did you get all that? We'll take the SSW TV quiz and test your knowledge now.